Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll call to order this May 12th session of the Escondido Library Board of Trustees meeting. Um, Virginia's on her way. She's just gonna be a couple minutes late. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so if we'd like to get started with the uh, approval, uh, oh, any correspondence, None. Zach? None? Okay, great, thank you. How about, uh, would anybody like to um, consider the minutes and make any adjustments or can I have a motion to approve? Okay. Move approval. Okay, Merrick seconds, great. Wonderful. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Do we have you there, aye. John? Oh, perfect, thank you. So motion yeah, approved, four, motion approved four zero. And uh, before we uh, move to item number uh, two, uh, at the request of staff, they'd like to move um, the Escondido discussion to uh, the second, to the item that would come first. If I'm not, was that the request, Dara? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Here we go. Ready? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Board of Trustees. Uh, thank you for allowing us to speak with you today. My name is Robert Rhodes. I am the Deputy Director of Community Services, and I am joined today by Danielle Lopez, the Assistant Director of Community Services. Uh, we are here today to talk about the Escondido discussion um, and just kind of give you a little bit of personal background between the two of us. Uh, we have actually been with the city for quite a few years. Um, uh, we're pushing probably almost 30 if you put both of our times together. So we've been working for the city for, for quite a long time and what we do is we direct the day-to-day -day operations of the Community Services Department, which includes the Recreation Division, our Aquatics Division, Older Adult Services, Senior Nutrition, um, and a variety of other uh, program areas, um, as well as uh, some uh, uh, capital improvement projects as well. So just kind of give you a little bit of background from, from us. All right, so the Escondido discussion is kind of why we're here today. Um, this is a really important part of the input process for the, uh, the budget process um, for City Council to kind of gather feedback from the community uh, on important uh, critical services that we as a city offer at this point in time. Uh, what we did back in December of 2021, we sent out a scientific survey to the community to kind of gather feedback and input from them to determine what their priorities were. And so we received back 1,300 responses from uh, the community members, which is a very strong response process, which we're very um, appreciative and glad about. Uh, this was also done in both English and Spanish to ensure that we got a very broad cross-section of the community. It was very important as well. Um, and so what they did is we came back um, to receive that information so we can kind of make some, as I mentioned, some very critical decisions in the budget process. So when we launched the Escondido discussion, the idea is for us to gather that information to kind of expand our uh, community survey, so that's why we're here today. Um, we also have information that is posted on our, our website um, as well, and then we're engaging in community dialogue, so uh, groups such as you, as well as a variety of different groups. We've done one over at the uh, Senior Center. Uh, we've also done a variety of them in front of various community and neighborhood groups, as well as some home Owners Association. So we're really trying to reach out to the public as broadly as we possibly can. Um, in addition to that, we've also done a variety of different workshops and public hearings with the City Council as well. 
Um, so in front of you, you will find that there is a survey um, that is in front of you. So again, a part of that feedback process. We also have a card that you have and that's got a QR code on it. And that QR code will take you to the website to be able to provide us that feedback if you prefer to respond digitally. So we will, again, we're gathering all sorts of feedback and input. And then at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll also be taking your questions and marking that down and um, taking that as well. All right, so what we're talking about is we're going to be talking about um, being able to maintain our city services in coordination with what the priorities of the community are. And that's why it was very important for us to provide that uh, survey um, to the community back in uh, December of 2021. So you may be wondering, first of all, um, what does a city do? What is a full service city? And the city of Escondido is actually a full service city. Um, and that means basically we cover a wide variety of city services um, and there are some things that we do not do and that provides a little bit of confusion unfortunately for the public. Uh, things that we do not do, we do not do education, we do not do um, uh, health services as well, but we do partner very closely with those organizations to be able to work through some challenges that the community may actually have or uh, perceive as a problem. So we're going to work through those um, with them. Um, most cities in North County are not uh, full service cities. There are very few, um, but we provide a variety of different from police and fire to parks and recreation, library services, of course, which is relatively rare, but it's a great thing. I love that about our city. Um, very important. So public works and, you know, uh, so on. So just some really quick facts that are right there in front of you about what some of the things that we do as a part of our full service city. We have over 6,000 acres of uh, park um, land. We have over 10,000 park trees. Uh, we have 20 uh, different parks at a variety of different levels, mini parks, pocket parks, uh, community and regional parks as well. We also have two lakes in this city. Uh, this one surprised me quite a bit when we were doing this process. We have 139 city-owned buildings, which is, equates to just over 1 million square feet. Um, I, was, I was floored when I heard that. I didn't realize the city had so many buildings, which is incredible. Uh, we do have over 58,000 street trees, so those trees that uh, align our, our streets and parkways. Um, we do have over 256 miles of storm drains. Um, 900 lane miles of roads and over 6,500 uh, streetlights. So that's quite a bit. So in talking about what those resident priorities are, so when we did that survey in December of 2021, uh, we were able to um, gather a variety of different feedback from them and basically came out to five different categories or buckets, if you will. Um, the first one being addressing homelessness, the second one being attracting businesses and jobs to Escondido, um, improving public safety and police services, um, maintaining and repairing our local streets, roads, and sidewalks, and then keeping public areas clean and graffiti free. So those were our, our five priorities that the community has designated what is important to them. So how do we continue to maintain our local city services and pay for the additional services to meet our community's needs and desires, um, like the ones that were identified in the survey? This graph shows the general fund per capita spending for um, local cities here in San Diego County. Um, as you will see, Escondido has the lowest per capita spending for the services it provides compared to the others. There are a few things that are important to note here. Carlsbad and Oceanside are the only other full service cities, and Oceanside is the only city that's comparable in size to us here at Escondido. It's also important to note the legal requirements of a general law city versus a charter city. So Escondido and Oceanside are general law and San Marcos, Vista Poway, uh, those are all um, charter. So charter cities get to write their own laws and um, um, general law cities, um, like us, our, our laws are set by the state. So we uh, don't have as much control as those other cities have. And for example, uh, it limits what we can contract out for and what we can't. That's okay. 
Um, so this is a pie graph that shows the sources of revenue for the city. Um, sales tax is the single largest source of revenue for, to the general fund. These revenue sources are dependent on um, the economy and they can fluctuate so you know they're not always stable when you eat in an Escondido restaurant or shop at our local mall you pay a sales tax on your purchase of 7.75 percent currently of that amount only one percent stays local here in Escondido and goes towards uh, services that the city can provide um, if you own a home in Escondido, you'll receive an annual property tax bill. Of that bill, um, the city receives 10% of that amount and the remaining goes to the school district, the San Diego County, and other tax entities. Other general fund revenue sources are impacted by the economy, but not to, not, um, to the same degree. So those include license and permits, fines, charges for service, and then other revenues things like property, sales, things like that. So this is going to show how our sales tax is broken down, pretty much uh, what I was just explaining in the last slide. So the current sales tax rate for Escondido is 7.75%. So for every $100 in taxable, in, in taxable uh, purchases, um, you'll be charged $7.75. Of that $7.75, $6 will go to the state, one dollar will remain here in Escondido. Fifty cents will go to Transnet, which is a program through Sandag that helps support um, traffic, bicycle, transportation infrastructure projects. And 25 cents goes to the county of San Diego. So as you heard Robert say earlier, the city has been a fiscal steward of taxpayer dollars and many efforts have been made over the years to reduce costs, curtail deficits, and maintain a balanced budget, but often with the use of one-time monies, which isn't sustainable for long-term. If any of you watched city council meeting last night, you heard that the city is facing an $8 million budget gap this year. So again, this is why we are here talking with you. Um, there are going to be critical decisions that are going to have to be made this year and in the future years um, about city services um, and what we will be able to maintain and what we will have to cut. Um, we're going to start talking about cost control measures that we've done over the years. So the city's been struggling with a structural deficit for years. Um, we've been very cost cautious and have implemented a variety of strategies to reduce the deficit. Um, while the population has grown by more than 10% since 2008, 2008 um, the city's workforce has been reduced by more than 10% more than 140 employees, less than um, pre-recession levels. Several years ago, Escondido enacted pension reform for new and existing employees that stabilized the city's long-term pension obligation by significantly increasing the amount that our employees pay toward their own retirement, which lessens the city's obligation. Another way we decreased spending was forming partnerships, something that you all are very familiar with, like the partnership with Library Systems and Services to operate our library, um, which has resulted in cost savings for the city, as well as increased hours and services to our library patrons. So win-win for everyone. Um, we've also leveraged technology to create efficiencies. We offer a lot of 24-hour services where people can pay their bills online, register for classes, and renew their business license. Um, so trying to create those efficiencies within our staff and for our residents. Some other cost control measures that we have implemented. Um, we hear over and over again that we need to fill our potholes and fix our broken sidewalks, and we totally do agree with that, um, but those are just two of a long list of infrastructure needs that oftentimes get deferred. Um, the city's infrastructure is significant, and it requires a high commitment to maintenance. Deferring maintenance on city streets, facilities, parks, um, at more than $8 million annually has been a cost control measure that we have used. Um, but it comes at a risk because you um, suffer more damage when you're not maintaining your facilities, right? The repairs are more than if you had just kept up with them, you know, throughout the, 
the time. And it can result in safety issues if you really let it go too long. Uh, the industry standard f calls for repaving streets every seven years. So by repaving streets over longer cycles, as well as extending replacement for roofs, playgrounds, um, ball field fencing, vehicle purchases, et cetera, uh, we have been able to stretch our budget, but it just doesn't serve the community as well as we should. So how are we actually getting things done? I'm sure you've seen, you know, we're putting in NFC courts, we're doing a huge um, creek trail project. Uh, those are all the result of, most uh, times, are all the result of either one-time funding through grants or through um, development impact fees, which the grants and the fees all have restrictions on them. So there, there aren't things that we can apply to our general fund deficit. So rising service demands and capacity concerns. Despite the cost control measures and the efforts um, to fund our projects with grants and other sources of one-time funding, um, it just won't be enough for the growing demand on services. So as we showed you earlier, the city provides so much and does so with less funding than our neighboring cities. Since 2008, the city's grown by over 8,000 residents and emergency calls for services have increased 30% but staffing levels have not kept pace with those increasing demands. So there's a couple of reasons um, for that. Primary factors driving up our call volume are the increased population, the aging population here in Escondido, the impact of homelessness on our community, and the increased reliance on 911 and emergency room medical care. We also see capacity issues in our other city services, um, such as turnaround times for building permits, business licenses, um, addressing code violations, and just responding to other community quality of life issues. So as uh, Danielle pointed out, there is definitely a rising demand um, and a decreased capacity of city staff to be able to um, kind of meet all of these needs within the city. So it puts us in a very difficult, very tough position, especially if we are not able to receive a locally controlled sustainable revenue source um, in the near future. So what's going to happen on the next couple of slides that I'm going to show you are some potential cuts. And I, I want to stress potential cuts to city services. So um, that's what we're going to talk about. All right. The first one being uh, law enforcement. Well, the community has, excuse me, the community has mentioned to us that maintaining public safety in Escondido is very important. We 100% agree with you. Um, securing that additionally locally uh, controlled funding source would help the city be able to maintain that public safety service. That is such a priority, both including fire protection, paramedics, uh, emergency services, and of course, police services. As of right now, since uh, 2008, the city actually has 11 less sworn officers than we did um, pre, um, not pandemic, pre-recession. Um, um, so unfortunately, even more cuts are on the horizon um, should we don't um, be able to find that locally sourced revenue. Uh, and that will include and impede the uh, police department's ability to be able to address some critical issues in their uh, primary areas, including crime, crashes, and community. That means that proactive prevention and diversionary programs to traffic enforcement and educational efforts, as well as the ability to respond to anything other than serious crimes could be impacted. So as far as the, the fire department is concerned, uh, over the course of the last 10 years, that staffing has remained steady. So there has been no changes in staffing um, for that period of time. But unfortunately, the call volume has increased from 13,000, just over 13,000 annually, to just under 17,000 calls annually. That is approximately 30% increases in response with no additional staffing and no additional um, resources for them to be able to, to support that. So really the fire department is at or above capacity for the size of this community. 
um, and they're in desperate need of more personnel as well as resources to be able to achieve uh, those call volumes, especially considering that the forecasted rate for that is to continue uh, anywhere from 3 to 4 percent annually um, as those call volumes do increase. So if cuts are likely, we are looking at the possibility of the closure of a single fire station uh, within, our, within our community. One of the other priority areas that the community has identified is um, to keep the city clean and free of graffiti as one of their top priorities. Um, last year, city crews removed approximately 36,000 graffiti tags uh, within the community, which is about um, just under 700 tags per week, which is uh, pretty incredible. Uh, they've also cleared out almost 800 homeless encampments um, with enough debris that would is able to fill 35 swimming pools. That's pretty significant. Um, the, graffiti, the graffiti eradication program is actually an award-winning program uh, that we were able to receive because of our proactive approach. Unfortunately, that means that a program would probably or likely go away. Maintaining our, and repairing our local streets and sidewalks is another top priority for the community and inability to be able to fund this important work would result, of course, in more potholes, uh, additionally lifting sidewalks and creating uh, possible trip hazards for individuals, uh, longer wait times for street repairs on lights and traffic signals, uh, less tree maintenance, and then, of course, just the buildup of blight and debris throughout the city. Of course, an area that is near and dear to our hearts is the uh, uh, parks and recreation um, or community services portion. Um, the city of Escondido is currently home to a wide variety of parks and recreational opportunities, including hundreds of acres of preserved open space and trails, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, we have uh, an amazing amount of um, uh, natural uh, beauty with the Dixon Lake, Lake Wolford, Daly Ranch, and obviously more than 20 urban parks and recreation facilities and community centers that offers free and low-cost recreational programming to families of all ages. So providing uh, these much-needed spaces to uh, recreate, relax, and play is an important part of this city's uh, future. We especially saw that during the pandemic when everybody was so stuck in and really wanted to get out. And how did they do that? They went to our parks to be able to do that. So um, we are working towards promoting that sense of community. Um, and it improves uh, property values as well and enhances the business climate and local economy for people that want to move here. They move here for a couple of different reasons. They move here for schools and they move here for parks and recreation. So um, that's why we feel that Parks and Rec is very important. Now, of course, we've spoken about the um, amount of deferred maintenance that already exists, uh, but uh, potentially additional cuts may threaten the closures of all, um, a lot of these programs and amenities as well. So the city council has formed a subcommittee consisting of the mayor and council member Morosco, and they meet regularly to review the budget and, and anticipated deficits, to explore the community input that we've received, um, to explore options on our budget, and ultimately to make a, res a recommendation to the entire council on how to move forward with securing additional locally controlled funding that would help the city maintain these important services that have been identified. Um, as we always do, we invite everyone, you and the public, um, to connect and engage with us. Uh, we want to hear from you, and there's a variety of ways you can do that. Um, this, we have our social media pages there um, that you can utilize. We also have volunteer opportunities where um, you can volunteer for specific events, boards and commissions, as you all are already, um, community advisory groups, um, and then of course we have a number of newsletters that we distribute through the city that you can um, sign up for. So now we'd like to hear from you. Uh, we just shared what we're facing and the efforts that we're doing to try to um, address the budget issues that we're having. Um, so 
we have a variety of tools, sorry, we have a variety of tools for you to use. I handed out at the beginning of the meeting um, written surveys that you're welcome to take, or there are cards with a QR code, um, and you can take the survey online. Um, if you have any questions, comments, uh, this does conclude our presentation. We'd love to take your comments back to the group to share with the council and the, and the subcommittee. Um, so we will leave it open to you for questions and comments. And thank you for this opportunity to present this to you. Great. Thank you so much, Robert and uh, Danielle. Really appreciate your time and coming out. I know you do, John. I, I figured you did. I'm going to get started with the folks in the room, if that's okay, John. Sure, whatever you want to do. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I think um, my first question is, uh, I think before the pandemic, the city had been exploring a, a sales tax revenue um, increase measure. Do we know if that's um, headed for the ballot for November? I, I can speak to that. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the, the process in 2020, uh, the council considered placing a revenue measure on the ballot. Ultimately, they voted against doing so. Oh. Uh, it requires a supermajority of the city council to do so. And uh, this go around, they're still in the stages of discussing the possibility, but it's going to be determined first by the revenue measure subcommittee that both Robert and Danielle referred to. They'll be making a formal recommendation uh, in the short period of time. One thing to know is that the city is also going to be conducting a revenue measure poll uh, in the next month. and then. That data will be brought back to the city council and then they'll determine whether or not they want to place a revenue measure on the ballot yeah. okay if we should increase the sales tax by say a half cent does the state still get 80 percent of that I, be I believe the formula will remain the same correct yeah it, yes so so if uh so if we raise the uh, rate uh, by one percent when you see this, we would get $2 instead of $1. So we wouldn't, no additional funding would go to the state. The, that $1, oh. that one additional dollar would come back to Escondido. Okay. So still $6 only for the $6 state. $6 only for the state. Okay. We would just be getting one additional dollar uh, out of that 100. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, just the only other comment I had on your presentation was that um, we talk a lot about the other city services, specifically um, what we do with the police and fire department. I noticed we don't have any statistics on the services that the library really provides. We kind of just say that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but we are very, very popular. Um, and I think it would be great if we could provide some statistics just to show the weight and the influence that the library has on the community. Um, I'm sure that either Dara, Katie, or I could give you some statistics, or even uh, Joanna would likely have them too, mm -hmm. uh, just because I think uh, it is such a pillar of our community, and I would like uh, the public to know what we do, what kind of effect we have. Absolutely. I appreciate that feedback. And this presentation is evolving as we go. You know, every time we go out, people ask questions, we'll add additional information. So I'll definitely take that back and we'll okay, great. see if we can get something added. Awesome. Um, Merrick, Ron, or Virginia, would, would you like to ask any questions or make any comments? Well, the hard part of this is... Uh, Every one of these are very important on the survey. The problem for me is I don't have any reference as to how much each one of these might cost. Because I know if we increase police or don't defund police, that's a lot more expensive than removing graffiti, for example. So that I find that a little bit difficult. It's a very good survey and all these points are really very important to the city, but when I think about trying to to answer it that's the part where I I don't know which way to go because uh, cleanliness and graffiti that's wonderful but it's a lot less expensive than keeping the police force or the firemen's running and so I, I don't know I don't know how to I wouldn't know how to tell you to to alleviate this either okay but it's but it is it is an issue obviously and Ron, to that point, it was a very, very well stated point. I just thought to, to add to it is that right now our budget is about 65% allocated towards just police and fire. Right. So it's a, it's a very large amount of our budget goes in that direction. See, I think that, I think these, I've been in this town since 67. I didn't realize the state was taking so much of our sales tax. That really upsets me. And so I think it's good to let people know these, these, your presentation is good because uh, uh, I just didn't realize that situation. I think it's good for people to know. 
I have a just question going back to the money. So if we did raise sales tax by one penny, how much additional revenue would that bring to the city? Yeah, so to, to that extent, if we did it, it would um, raise approximately $28 million every year if we raise it by one cent. Uh, if we raise it by three quarters of a cent, that would be $21 million a year. And then if we raise it by half cent, it would be $14 million a year, approximately. And the deficit is $8 million. $8 million, correct. Thank you. I mean, those are probably matters more for the city council and than for the library board of trustees, but thank you so much. For sure. By all means. Yeah. You okay? Okay, John, wh what are your comments? John, are you there? I see your uh, phone is there. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, I, fortunately, I've seen this presentation before, so that uh, I, 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 I can visualize the slides. That was helpful. Um, I see two things here. One, uh, the property tax revenues are controlled by Prop 13, so the increase in that is like nominal, what, percent, percent and a half a year, which doesn't keep up with inflation, and the city needs to get more money somewhere. Uh, the only other choice is property is uh, sales tax. Uh, and what really brought this to the head uh, was the extra pension requirements that the state put on us, uh, I think two years back, uh, I could be wrong on the timing, uh, to uh, service the upcoming old school pensions, which are no longer, um, as, as uh, Daniel mentioned, that it's the new pension plan that was put in place roughly 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, took care of that, but we already had the existing ones that we're still funding. Um, that is a short-term problem. Uh, I think uh, the city would be best served to, to just come out and say that and tell, how, tell everybody how much of the deficit we're facing is caused by that and when it's going to stop, because it is going to stop in a couple of years, and make that part of the sales tax increase, um, just make that into a, a sunset. And uh, Lord knows we need more money and that's the only way to get it uh, for all the other services on the city because the city is paying uh, uh, increased costs just with uh, normal inflation uh, and the sales tax revenues as static and the property tax revenues as very, very small annual increases aren't helping us and we need to take action to get caught up. And I think you had one slide that showed that we're like a three quarters of a percent or a full percent less than every other city in North County in sales tax. And uh, that's why we've got this problem. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, Thank I, can, I can address your uh, question concerning uh, the unfunded pension liability. So uh, it's forecasted that we'll be uh, running that um, issue until 2044 is when it actually uh, gets resolved. And uh, so from that vantage point, uh, the way this particular revenue measure would work if it were to proceed uh, is that we would actually uh, not be allowed to utilize funds from this revenue measure to allocate towards uh, pension uh, obligations. However, those pension obligations exist, so we still have to pay them from our general fund, which is causing that structural deficit that you referred to. So we the pots of money would be controlled differently. A revenue measure would be overseen by a revenue measure um, citizens oversight committee that wouldn't be allocating funds in that direction. But your point is well taken. The uh, pension obligation does play a role, but it's not something the revenue measure funding can actually technically directly go towards. Okay, great. I think the only other comment I had is getting back to incorporating the library more. Um, when we talk about infrastructure and uh, the amount of time we're having between when we, you know, pave roads or, or fix things, the library is exactly in that state. So that's why we're going out for the grant. But um, there will likely be a needed public piece. So I just want to make sure that the public understands that through this, you know, the library has taken multiple steps to reduce cost. And um, moving forward, we're also pursuing grants that allow us to fulfill the infrastructure shortfalls that we have. Well, in addition, we've signed a contract with LSNS. I don't know how we would yep. cut that cost until we, the contract is up and we're negotiating a new contract with them. So I think that has to. 
I don't want to advertise that to the people like there's a possibility when when we were locked into a contract. Mm -hmm. And then just one more thing for the record. Um, we were able to bring our services up to pre-pandemic levels within two months of opening. So we're really doing a great job and I wanna make sure that, you know, from a city perspective, people understand the commitment that our staff has to serving the community. Okay, great. Anything else? No? Well, no, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay, and then I do want to just address something real quick that is not under current business. Um, I think uh, we are supposed to have voted on um, the leadership of the board oh, yes. in April. That, had, that wasn't placed on today's agenda. Oh, it was. It, it's, it was not. Oh, okay. Uh, so we could do the vote now. Right now, as it currently stands, the two of you can continue on in your roles and you're re reappointed. So if you would like, we could delay that until the main meeting. It just defaults back to where you are right now. So you're okay. serving as president and then uh, John is Rusty Schwab is yeah. serving as secretary. So if you want, um, I, I might recommend holding off until the next meeting to vote on that, just so you have a little more time to process it. But if you'd like, we, we could do so now. It's not something that technically needs to be agendized. I'm gonna leave it up to the board, so yeah. Let's put it on the next, next meeting agenda. John will be here and okay. yeah. Okay, great. John, is that good with you? John, you still there? I see your phone. I think it might be like a delay or something. Yeah, he's quite a ways away. All right, John, if, if you yeah, hear us, oh, perfect. Yeah, what are your thoughts, John? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that if you want to postpone until next month. Perfect, thank you Great. so much. Great. Okay, wonderful. So uh, how about we then start with the trust funding request? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Um, we try not to delve into the trust fund too often since it's not a quick growing or a barely growing account. Um, but we do have need for office chairs. Um, pretty Well, almost everyone's chair is broken in one way or another in the building. So we're looking at the replacement of 38 chairs, looking at office max and staples prices. We're estimating for a good long-lasting chair approximately $350 per chair. So we're looking at $13,300 as a request for new chairs for the library staff. Um, the other piece of the request is the $608.74 that it's going to cost to uh, bury the wires you see in the image on the agenda. Uh, below the ground. Uh, currently, they are above ground and they're in a high traffic area of um, the circulation area where um, the rangers typically work. Um, so we would like to just bury those so they're not visible. And that is our request. So um, I'm hoping that maybe you make a motion, a motion and vote on that funding. Yeah, I, I, this is John. I move to approve both. Uh, John, can, it looks like Ron might have a question. I, uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of these, but I wondered if you'd considered LS and S's buying power rather than going downtown to Staples or someone. I don't know if they do that, but if they did, we w would at least take a look at it. We absolutely would. Unfortunately, um, their buying power comes more for databases or if we were doing like true library furniture like replacing shelving uh, they would be able to do that the reason i request it from the trust is i look at it as city property everything in the building belongs to the city so that was my rationale for requesting it from the trust okay i'll second john's motion then to approve both okay. all, all those in favor Aye. Aye. John? Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Motion approved 5 0. Great. Thank you. 350 is quite cheap. The ones at my work are like $800. So, <laughs> but they're not any, they're not very good. It, so. Well, we're nonprofit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Um, I guess that brings us to the trust report itself. 
Um, if it's okay, I'd like to add just one more thing just to think about, sorry, for the, for the trust funding. Um, I know John discussed it in the last meeting that we had, but we do sell some merchandise at the library to patrons, and it's usually items that are high need, such as USB flash drives, earbuds, because we no longer provide headphones because of hygiene issues, as well as um, tote bags. Um, in the past, prior to LSNS coming in, um, we were able to purchase the wholesale of those items using trust funding because the markup that is charged to patrons comes back into the trust. Um, so I was going to kind of put it out there that we would like to start requesting maybe an annual up to like $500 amount to replenish those things and then again those that that markup will go back into the trust so that's something I may bring up in the next few meetings when we run low on our supplies so just kind of wanted to put that out there okay um, so the trust report again this is a quarterly report of where you're at as far as um, income interest and all of that for the trust um, I know we had the economic uh, folks here a couple meetings ago to kind of discuss what the trust looks like. Um, it's just the report as of the second quarter. So if you have any questions, we'll send them on to city finance. Anyone in the room have questions? Well, the 159, uh, Katie, is the 159, that's what we are committed to spending, correctly? Correct. Right. So this is one of those things where if you look at the um, those buckets, the 2021-2022 budgeted expenditures, these are buckets that were set up over time. Um, so that amount of money has already been either requested or held over for several years in some cases. So um, of that total 275 or four hundred and thirty four thousand nine hundred and ninety five dollars a hundred and fifty nine thousand three hundred and seventy dollars were um, they're committed kind of put into those buckets so one of those things we may want to look at doing in the future is cleaning this up because I mean the chairs and the technology like the chairs and the sinking the cables will probably come out of the li the library technology um, and trust special projects line items but we're not really, we haven't really earmarked any of this other stuff that's kind of a holdover, like $25,000 for the youth services um, info. So that might be one of those things where at some point we take a look at those projects again and put some of that back into the, just the base level. Do we have a blurb or a paragraph that says what the purpose of, of each of these were? I do not, okay. but I don't know if that's something we can ask okay. the city. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, I, think we talked about the city. This, I remember uh, vaguely going ago. over it with Joanna um, at the very we, beginning we, um, the back in June. The consensus was we'll, June we'll wait until next year when we can get this in the, pro in the process before city council and all that because we were kind of late in the, pro in, the, in the game doing it this year and right. we'll get this all cleaned up. Sorry, John. I think we missed quite a bit of what you were saying. Could could you um, could you repeat? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing quite a bit of what you're saying too. The, the, the connection's not that good. Um, I think it was last meeting and the meeting before we had uh, a general discussion on trust yeah. fund and uh, chose to put off until next fiscal year to get this cleaned up because we were kind of late in the game. At getting it all done and getting it before city council uh, before June of this year. So I think we're all on the same page. Yeah, I think you're right, John. I think what um, I had asked Dara was, do we have um, record or anything that says what the scope of each of these line items is? And so I think what she was saying is that we could potentially go back to the city because we don't have that readily available go back to the city and right. ask so that we have co like a better yeah, understanding uh, to the, kick off the, the, the project. The, the person that came from finance, uh, I believe, has all that. Okay, great. Wonderful. I would suggest that maybe we put a placeholder, say, for September, which gives three months to start getting it ready, but we, that way we don't forget about it and put it off. So maybe on the September agenda, we have it on and start trying to clean this up. Great. Sounds good. Okay, great. 
I'm glad you agree, John. John, do you have any other, any anything else for this topic? I do not. Okay, great. All right, um, we just did the Escondido discussion. So I think it is now time for Dara's. Oh, and you know what, Dara, welcome back. This is our first time yeah, you know, with you in a while, so Thank happy you. to have you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next line, uh, or the next item up, is the collection development budget review. Um, I shared with you a page that um, one of our trustees had requested comparing last year to this year. Um, I don't know if you have specific questions I can start with, or do you want me to go line by line on this? Okay. Did, uh, did John get a copy of this? Yes. yes? Um, okay, so everyone received a copy of this in the email, and then John was actually the trustee requesting, so he, he got a copy before you all did. Oh, oh good. Okay. <laughs> John, did you have any um, comments on this one? Um, just some general questions, because most of the amounts are either at or very close to where they were the year before. Mm -hmm. um, just, just general stuff. Um, the only one that increased um, in, in dollar terms quite a bit was the uh, $50,000 for database, which last year was 46. And I, I have two questions on that. Uh, first, um, what databases are we talking about? Uh -huh. All of them. Um, <laughs> um, so that includes all of our databases from Hoopla to Chilton's, um, along with uh, cost for, for um, items like Flipster, which are, are received through um, Sarah, Overdrive, all of them. Um, sorry, help me out, Katie. You have some off the top. Yeah, so basically here's what happened. Last year we had less money set aside for Hoopla because we had an overage in that account from the year prior because they're not on the same, like we can put money in there as kind of a credit, right? So at the end of the last fiscal year, we had something like twelve to $14,000 due to the pandemic and things were not published on time. So in order to meet our spending for the fiscal year, we put that money into Hoopla that kind of acted as a buffer, right? So instead of putting the $28,000 into Hoopla that we normally need to, to sustain what we usually get in use, we only had to put, I think, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think we only put something like 18,000 in there last year because we still had quite a bit left over in that. Um, our actual database money for this year for the physical databases has gone down because the California State Library has supplemented our funding for BiblioBoard, for um, oh, some of our EBSCO databases as well. The Ancestry A to Z and um, uh, Cloud, no. Pronunciator, A to Z, and Ancestry all went up slightly in cost due to inflation, as did Chilton. Um, Cloud Library actually came down significantly, so we were paid $2,000 for our platform fee. We're going to pay this year. We paid around $3,000 the previous year. So on the second page is page 12 of your packet. It actually is the breakdown of what those databases are. We did have a few, like I said, go up due to inflation, but we did have kind of, it kind of, Overall, the category went up due to the hoopla is kind of the overall. Um, and I do have that breakdown available as well if anyone really wants to see granularly how expensive each database is. Okay, so there was no price increases from the databases. It was just what you said. Right, there were no, right. We okay. didn't have any price increases and we were paid ahead primarily on hoopla. I mean, there was a little bit of inflation. Okay. We like two of them went up by like two to three hundred dollars just because of inflation, but we didn't add any new ones. And then we also had okay. more funding come from the state of California. Yeah, and and, and, I, and although it didn't change, I was kind of surprised. I guess I'm just surprised that we spend that much on adult DVDs, but there, obviously there's a demand or we wouldn't do it. There is. Um, DVDs are a tough one for me. Over and over, I keep thinking that's going to be a, a collection we completely get rid of. Um, the circulation's <laughs> just too high and there's too much of a demand, I thought. Um, and we're watching it closely post-COVID because I thought that might have forced a lot of people to learn to stream. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case looking at numbers so far. So that collection might be with us for another 10 years. 
Okay, then I just have a, a general um, uh, statement, I guess, uh, question to, uh, to everyone. Um, we've had the same collection budget number, I believe, since um, the 2018. Mm -hmm. That 238 and change has been, I believe, the same uh, through today. It um, it, it, I'm sorry, um, it's cutting out, I didn't hear anything. Hi, okay, I was just going to mention it does actually go up slightly um, periodically with inflation. So there is some increase to that that's written into the contract. Um, so far, you feel like it's serving us very well. We do have some money specifically in a line item in the trust that can supplement the collection should we run short um, on any given year. But so far, it's worked out pretty well. OK, I, I, I hadn't seen any inflation adjustment in the collection budget since 2018. I, I guess maybe I'm not paying attention. Um, but is, is there a process in place where uh, the city looks at the collection budget and any cost increases that we're seeing uh, and can either choose or not choose to increase the collection budget to keep it in line so it's, you know, basically has the same purchasing power that it had when we started? I can um, go back and review that in the contract. I didn't bring the contract with me today, but it does allow for some increase. And then I can um, see what it says as far as reviewing that during the contract period, because that might not be something that we would change until um, a contract renewal. Yeah, but that's, ten, that's a 10 year span and, you know, we're losing we could potentially and i say potentially because i don't have all the facts we could be losing purchasing power on our collection budget if we're not adjusting it for inflation on a regular basis and i do you know, what you're actually experiencing and in cost increases and i do believe we do have it mapped out i will double check the numbers and i can share those with you and the rest of the trustees in an email later today okay yeah, just a reminder, though, that the okay, contract. Um, um, OK, that's, that's the end of my questions. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks, John. Just a reminder that the contract can't predict the rate of inflation, right? So whatever we build into there, if it's 2% and as we're seeing it, 7% nowadays, we'll have to just roll with the punches, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but like Dara and Katie said, we have a line item in the trust that we could potentially leverage if, if needed. And we have been lucky with the state really stepping up right. during the whole COVID process as well. Okay, so. okay anyone else um, have questions? No. Oh, Virginia. What is the um, difference in the Pioneer Room that's planned in the fiscal years? So that's another thing that I forgot to mention when John asked about databases. So. We pay $2,000 annually for the digitized um, Times Advocate paper storage. And it was previously marked as a Pioneer Room line item. However, that is more in line with our definition for platform fees and databases. So the $2,000 that is needed for digital reel was moved into the database line item and the two thousand dollars that they use for purchasing items was left in the pioneer room line item so i apologize that was one of the changes that was made okay great um if nothing else then we'll move on to the director's report seems like we're so far behind after taking um the april meeting off because i see march as the date but um in March, we um, had the dedication for the mural, which was very exciting. Um, very proud of that. I think it really, uh, that with the pocket park really increased just the visibility and it looks so much nicer driving by. Um, we did submit our uh, grant proposal for the um, infrastructure grant, so we're very hopeful that maybe we'll be getting a renovation in the not too distant future. Uh, we will be hearing back about that sometime in the summer, but the state has not said exactly 
what the date for uh, releasing any feedback will be. Um, the Youth Services Department was awarded a $5,000 library innovation grant. Um, that's a really interesting grant. It provides um, money to, well, they started with a survey, but they're doing focus groups as well to determine what we can do to reach out to um, new immigrant families in our community to introduce them to not only the resources of the library, but what they have access to within the city. Um, so we're uh, working on that. Our, one of our new youth services librarians, Maureen Hogan, wrote that and uh, um, was able to get it and is spearheading this project right now. Um, on um, March 31st, we hosted a speaker, um, Marco Lopez, and he spoke about his memoir, my March with Caesar in celebration of Caesar Chavez Day. Since we're open, uh, we would like to make it an effort to start doing an annual celebration on that day. And it was our first one, and it was well attended with, um, I think, 32 people in attendance on that one. Um, and in addition, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and talk about uh, the last week. We had a May the 4th week. And we ended up having over a hundred, well, I'm sorry, in total we had 700? Six, 652. We had 652 in total over the course of the week. Um, our uh, big day was the Comic Give Out Day on Saturday, and we had 195 in attendance. On May the 4th itself, we had 152. So we had a really good turnout. Um, lots of people uh, came in for that. And uh, we also showed Rogue One and had an, an attendance of 21, which is not horrible. We've had a hard time getting people to come out for movies. But uh, we're building that back up. But um, we've been a very busy place, and it's going well. And on behalf of the staff, we all want to thank you for the Library Appreciation Week. Having lunches sent over was really a big hit and very, very much appreciated. Thank you for that. Any questions? No? Virginia? I was wondering if you guys were planning to um, pay attention to the attendance now that cru on Friday afternoons and evenings now that Cruising Grand is starting, or if there is any thing that the library is doing um, around those times. We're not really doing anything in association with Cruising Grand. We will watch our our numbers. We just take them from the door count, mm -hmm. and we do it on a daily so daily hour by hour breakdown. Cruising Grand, I wouldn't say it typically increases the number of people in the library. Um, if anything, it kind of pulls a little bit because people start making their way over to Grand uh, on those evenings. And with the streets around us shut down, um, I think that contributes a little bit as well. But we can definitely pay attention. And if you'd like uh, any sort of report over that period of time, we can definitely pull something. Um, so with the grant that what the innovation grant for the um, immigrant families yes. and reaching out to them what are the parameters like does she do a report does she do a project or so it's similar I it's have you um, heard of Haywood Can, Haywood Haywood <clears throat> it's a training program for communities to kind of learn how to better assess the community needs. Okay, great. So that's um, the approach they're taking as far as trying to evaluate first what are the best programs. So even though the, the funds are awarded, we don't know exactly what program we're hosting yet. Okay. And she works hand in hand with um, a mentor from the state or uh, I guess a cohort from the state library that helps um, plan that process and uh, walk her through the various steps. Okay. So um, I guess we're waiting to see exactly okay. what the approach is, but she is in good hands to make sure that there's some guidance throughout the process. Definitely. Okay, great. I, I mean, I would be interested once she's finished with the program to, you know, have her come and ex share her experience and what she learned. That would be... Absolutely. Great. And we are going to get now that we're getting more and more back to normal, have a regular rotation between the Pioneer Room, Adult Services, Youth Services, Literacy. Okay, great. So we'll get, we'll get back into the swing of things, and that will be one of them. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? John, are you good? 
I am good. Okay. Um, why don't we do the around the room then of, of uh, what we've done or, or seen or experienced? Uh, John, would you like to go first? Um, okay, you kind of caught me off guard here. Oh, sorry. Um, that's all right. Uh, let's see, I was, I was going to say something. I'm trying to remember what it was. So you, but pass me over for a while. Okay, okay. Merrick? Okay, great. Uh, I really uh, found it uh, interesting and appreciated the Star Wars week that it was uh, something that uh, came by once with my son, and I wish I could have come every single day <laughs> because, well, he wanted to, by the way, but uh, too busy. But that, that's, that's great. I'm looking at your calendar for the summer. The, the, the teens go to the movies and, 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 and the reading challenges and everything. That's, that's excellent. So I would really appreciate you, you doing that. Yeah, that was the other nice thing about May the 4th. It falls perfectly because now Youth Services has like a six week break before they have to be ready to hit the ground running for summer reading program. So it will likely be a reoccurring annual event. Great work, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so what I'll share is that um, I get really excited for the beginning of May because that's usually when the Pulitzer Prizes are announced. And then I have this thing where I look up and see if they're in the library and then I'll go and, and put them on my list. Um, so I know that we have, I think, two of the runners up, but I, I, and I haven't done my investigations yet, so I'm really excited to see uh, and then rent some of the, the prize winners from this year. I can't remember at our last meeting. I I'm, echo your comments about the mural. I, I thought that ceremony was very nice that we had. Uh, that mural, you drive by it, it just adds a fresh uh, thing. I also want to compliment uh, Cookie and the library staff. I attended the volunteer luncheon. I'm a big fan of, I think our volunteers are fabulous. I think they're our best public relations in the community. And uh, to feed them at something like this was a lot of work for Cookie and some other people, but that's really a good program, and I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I also am very happy to see we have five staffs working on their M I M M L I S degrees, because that was a big issue, and I, I always watch that. Thank you for highlighting it. <laughs> I had a question about that. The degrees, do they get assistance? They do? Yes. Oh, awesome. Um, so my, I was able to attend the My March with Caesar on Caesar Chavez Day, yeah. and it was awesome. I invited my mom to come and, it, and my daughter. So the, uh, us three generations went together, and I love that the library provided that opportunity because my mom remembers those times in the 70s, and we're Hispanic family, so it does, it's very meaningful for us. And um, my mom, it kind of opened the conversation for, and brought back memories for my mom to share with my daughter. And so it was, I'm really um, thankful that the library is intentional about um, teaching about culture. I see how much you guys do, and I just appreciate that. Thank you. John, John back to you. Anything? Hey, John, you there? I think not. Sorry, okay, great. I forgot to push the mute button. Uh, okay. There's a periodical that I have been subscribing to, a finance uh, paper, and um, <clears throat> they uh, tripled the price on me. So I decided to, to let it drop and, and just go to the library and read it. And uh, that's worked out incredibly well. I just go in there and pick it up and sit down, uh, read it for 20 minutes, uh, I'm done and uh, go put it back on the shelf and uh, go about my business. So it's, it's great to have that kind of thing available. Yeah, it saves you a lot of money, it sounds like, too. That's great. Yeah, now, uh, but it's also uh, forcing me to think about, we need some new furniture in there. <laughs> uh, so I guess that's a good thing, too. I couldn't hear that from here. What does John go in and get? Uh, the periodical. Um, I'm, I'm, oh. 
uh, periodicals. Uh, I, the, I I would love love to to, to to hopefully see this grant work out. And even if it doesn't, um, we need to get some new furniture in in that area um, where the periodicals are and where people come in to study and and read, where um, they can have maybe a little bit more comfort and privacy. Um, and I'm sure staff has thought of that, but uh, there's no money right now for that. that. That's something we need to keep working on. Agreed. Although I don't believe the infrastructure grant covers furniture, so. Well, then uh, maybe we can go back to the well here. <laughs> yep. We go. We'll have to figure something out. Okay. Um, well, with that, I think we're good to adjourn. Um, John, thank you so much for joining us from far. We appreciate it. And then, um, yeah, I'll just hit my gavel because I can. Okay. Perfect.